Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our live webinar. I really hope that you're all staying safe and healthy out there. My name is Julie Tran, and I am the Digital Marketing Manager at NH Research. We are really excited to be launching a series of webinars for you presented by our application experts. And I will be your moderator for today's session on the fundamentals of battery module and pack test. Before we get started, this presentation is being recorded and will be sent to you after the session is over. I want to remind you that you can submit your questions by using the toolbox to the right of your screen. And we will answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. So on the toolbox, you'll see there's a tab for questions and you're, you'll be able to type in uh, any questions during the presentation. And if we do run out of time, we'll make sure to follow up with you after the session is over. So please ask away. Uh, we would also love it if you could please fill out the brief survey at the end of the webinar so that we can continue to provide valuable content for you and make sure that we can support your needs. Now I'd like to give a warm welcome to our speaker, Martin Weiss. I know him personally as the guru of testing, and I've always been so impressed with his wealth of knowledge across all types of industries and applications. Martin Weiss is the product director at NHR, and he has over 25 years of experience in testing batteries and building automated test systems. At NHR, he is also responsible for developing new hardware and software test solutions, and he has been such a great support to our customers on the front lines. So with that, we are really pleased to have him share his expertise with you today. So I think I will be handing it over to you. Why, well, thank you very much, Julie. <clears throat> Just to touch on who NH Research is, uh, many of you know who NH Research is, but for those of you who don't, NH Research is a test equipment manufacturer that enables electrification and helps to accelerate innovation, validation, and functional test of both today's and tomorrow's technologies. We have a long history in doing this exact type of thing and are backed by over 50 years of experience producing full power supply test systems, world-class instruments that provide the best-in-class performance, ease of use, and always a modular and scalable solution. It's our belief that this modular and scalability helps you with making sure that you get the right tools that reduce testing time, improve safety, and in many cases with regeneration have uh, very measurable energy savings. <clears throat> Our world-class test solution portfolio includes things such as battery and fuel cell test systems, which is what we'll be covering in part today, bi-directional DC sources, grid simulators, AC and DC electronic loads, as well as power supplies, and even comprehensive power supply test systems. In many ways, we are your partner in test and invite you to work with us to help identify the key solutions that will help you to move electrification forward. Looking through the agenda, we'll spend about the first 15 minutes or so covering the battery industry tens and the challenges in testing. And then we'll drill a little deeper into some of the fundamentals you know, some of the terminology, as well as the evolution of the battery test systems and how these battery test systems have come to be and where their strengths and weaknesses are. You know, I know here in California, it's a nice 70 degree day and many of us would rather be outside, but at the same time, knowing these terms will actually help in making sure that we produce very effective business decisions, either now or when we return to the office. I'd like to start by saying that batteries have become the pivotal component for transportation, electrification, as well as the storing of clean energy. Historically, batteries only played a small supportive role, such as the starter in your car, and it really didn't do anything other than sit there and wait for you to turn the key to turn on the car. 
However, more and more systems inside the vehicle, including parking lot mover maneuvers, or actually the vehicle itself are relying more and more on the battery. And it's critical that that battery actually works very well and provides the usage that the customer expects or the product is, as a whole is seen as being a poor product. <clears throat> if we look at the lithium ion industry trends, you know, lithium ion is one of many battery types but looking at just this particular battery type, which is one of the fastest growing battery types, we can see that the consumer electronics, which was your cell phones, laptops, camcorders, etc., made up a significant portion of the entire lithium ion battery market as recently as 2015. And while that market is growing, the emergence of electric vehicles is far outstripping and dominating the use of lithium ion batteries. Even today, there's more lithium ion batteries being used in passenger electric vehicles as a percentage of power than in all of the consumer electronics worldwide. And this trend is only increasing. Through this increased trend, the price of the chemistry, the price of the packaging, and the price of the battery systems themselves is coming down. And that's making other applications such as stationary storage, UPSs, electric buses, commercial EVs, more viable uh, by also providing very large battery packs for doing this kind of energy storage or uh, electrification. Let's see if I don't move to the next slide. Okay. <clears throat> In terms of motive applications or things that actually move, we are seeing an increasing amount of electrification, everything from electric motorcycles to cars to trucks, even to electric flight. In all of these applications, we're also seeing an increase in voltage levels. Your standard electric car or standard car used to have a 12 volt battery. And we're seeing a lot of manufacturers prefer a 48 volt system. While it has additional complexities, it provides increased control options, like being able to do parking lot maneuvers, or get the car to feel like it's starting and do off-the-line launching from stoplights or from a stopped case. As the voltage goes up, you can extract considerably more power, allowing for more uh, increased control options, such as DC fast charging or you know, launching power for trucks, buses, and even electric flight. Needless to say, batteries are unfortunately very hazardous. You may all are, be familiar with various cell phone models that have been banned on commercial flights. And as recently as last year, laptop manufacturers have had certain models also banned on flights. Electric vehicles have far many more batteries and far much more energy being stored in one single car than these cell phones and laptops. And so the potential for very dangerous situations is considerably higher. So we must make sure that the testing is done and everything that can be done to make sure that the product is safe should be being done. And that's not only to protect the end users from a hazardous event, but to also protect the brand image as well as the, under, uh, the way that people perceive the quality of your products. Beyond just safety, there's a very large money triangle, which is made up of the top three challenges here in this particular slide. Inherently, battery testing, no matter what kind of testing you're doing, generally takes a long time to complete. Batteries just don't like to give up their answers very quickly. While you're doing something like a charge or a discharge, then a significant amount of data you know, what was the voltage and current at a particular time? And then what is the voltage and current at the next time? Is being collected while that charging or discharging is being done. That means that this data has to be stored and collected in some ways, and then usually analyzed to determine, is this particular test provided me the data and the answers that I'm looking for? If there's an error detected in the test step, setup, especially during that data managing or data processing side, 
This can end up meaning you have to rerun the entire test again, which takes a lot of time. So making sure that there's a way to protect getting the test done correctly, possibly even analyzing the data while the test is running, so that way you know that the results are actually coming out as expected, would keep you from having to rerun the tests. There's also significant differences in the tests that are required for each application. For example, if you had designed a skateboard, which is a motor and a frame and a battery, that you could put any different kind of vehicle on top of, and this is a very common approach for most EV manufacturers, the car type would end up needing to be tested the way that the car would be used, which can be very difficult, different than a package delivery van, which has different weights and loadings and even driving patterns compared to a standard passenger car. So different tests can be application driven and require then this overall testing to be done. We've already touched about batteries being hazardous and there is a significant capital investment in not only the equipment that's being used, but the integration fixtures, potentially the software that's being used to drive this entire as manpower as well. If we move on to uh, some of the battery testing fundamentals, we're going to cover some of the terminology and some of the pieces that are used to explain how a test is created, etc. I like to start by discussing a cell and what I mean by a cell versus a module or a pack. A cell is the smallest device which can convert chemical energy into electrical energy. And for rechargeable batteries or secondary batteries, this process can be reversed where it can be applied electrical energy and store that energy in the form of chemical energy. This is a component and is an individual device. You can think of this as like a AA battery, which we're all familiar with. Cells then are often put into a module, which then makes that cell more useful in some way. And so a module can consist of one or more cells along with packaging, a connector system, electronics, etc. If you were to carefully take apart a 9-volt battery, you would see that inside that 9-volt battery are actually multiple cells, either three or six, four or six individual battery cells, which has been packed into that can and then that can also provides the interesting little end connector, makes it a little easier to plug in. And so a nine volt battery is an example of a module. It could also be described as a pack, which is then a construction of any number of modules, including one, wrapped with an outer housing, electronics, packaging, etc., to make it be used in a specific end application. While we talk about cell, which goes into a module, which goes into a pack, there are actually fundamental differences in what types of testing would be done at each of these. The cell, being that it's a component, is usually materials-based testing. How does this chemistry work versus modules or packs, which have been designed for some purpose? And so now we're testing to make sure that this construction, this arrangement, and this design is actually suitable for an application, whether at a subsystem or at a system level. So again, just to make sure we reinforce that, when I consider cell testing, cell testing is generally very chemistry focused. How does this particular chemistry work? What's it good for? You know, does it lean more towards an energy type application or more towards a power application? If I'm doing temperature testing, I'm usually asking, how does this particular component change with different temperatures? Versus an application focused testing where now I'm looking at, does this product actually meet my goals? Or are there under any unexpected interaction? Is one part of the module or the pack heating up? and therefore throwing off the expected behavior of the entire assembly or changing the way that the entire battery works. I know this is a very busy slide, 
and we do have an application note that goes into quite a few more of these details for you that you can download later. But it is absolutely important that we cover some of the terminologies just so that way we make sure we're all on the same page. If we start here with battery capacity, battery capacity is a measure of how much energy is actually being stored inside of this battery system. This is often expressed in terms of watt hours or kilowatt hours, and you would have seen that on electric vehicles. This, bat this particular EV has an 80 kilowatt hour pack or a 100 kilowatt hour pack. It may also be uh, being expressed in the terms of amp hours, and this is more common with some of the consumer electronics. The new Note 20, for example, has a certain amp hour rating for its battery pack. Both of these are a way of measuring just how much does this particular battery store. Watt hours is a true measure of energy or kilowatt hours. It's the average voltage times the amp hour rating of the cell. And so again, for electric vehicles, you can see that they often will rate electric vehicles in terms of kilowatt hours. If we look at amp hours, we first sort of need to understand something about battery configuration. Remember, watt hours is the average voltage times the amp hours of the cell. Lithium ion cells can be placed in series. This is then placing one on top of another to increase the voltage, and similar to putting two batteries inside of your remote control for your TV. But these batteries can also be placed in parallel making it effectively a larger battery. So if I consider taking four cells, I can arrange them where I have one in series and four of them in parallel, or I can arrange them where I have four in series and one of them in parallel. And there's another configuration which is not shown here where there are two in series and two in parallel. But if I stick with just this example shown and we simplify the math and say this is a five volt battery at 10 amp hours per cell, then when one of these batteries is in series, we would have five volts, and we would have 20 amp hours times the number that are in parallel, or an 80 amp hour battery pack. If I take those same four cells and just change the configuration, I have now hooked up five times the volt, or four times the voltage, or 20 volts, and only one times the amp hour rating, or 20 amp hours. In both cases, this is the same amount of energy, or the voltage times the current in amp hours, but the rating of amp hours is very different. In this case, 80 amp hours, and in this case, 20 amp hours. Part of the reason for going through that is this, an amp hour rating is if I discharged one amp, how many hours would it last? where if I discharge that number, the amp hour rating, it would be discharged in one hour. That discharge in one hour is also the C rate. The reason that C rate is used is it gives a way to write a test standard that says regardless of the configuration, how fast might I discharge the battery? So if I discharge the battery at C divided by three, that would be a three hour rate or C divided by four, that would be a four hour rate. Going back to our configuration over here, the 80 amp hour configuration on the left would be needing 20 amps to be discharged in four hours, or 80 amps to be discharged in one hour. So the C in this case is 80, and C over four is the 20. The other configuration, however, I would, it's a 20 amp hour pack, so the amp hour rating, or the one hour rate, would be 20 amps. And again, C over four would be one fourth of that, or five amps. And so again, C rate acts as a nominalizing factor that allows a test standard to describe how fast batteries are being charged or discharged without having to know, when writing the standard, what is the particular battery configuration. It's then up to the test engineer to apply this battery configuration information into the test and size the test equipment for the, tip, the amount of current needed at each step throughout the test. 
There are quite a few other terms, such as impedance, DCIR, and many others that we cover inside of the app note. So I, when you receive the link, I would encourage you to download the app note to reinforce these terms. There are also other terms that are very important, but are learned by doing some battery testing. For example, the state of charge, or SOC, is a very commonly used term and actually can mean different things to different people. The battery test engineer may be interested in the chemical state of charge. How much can I actually store and discharge in this particular battery versus the applications engineer, which is looking at it from the design level. If some has been reserved to make sure we maximize the life, we may only use a portion of the battery's capability to, to charge and discharge for the application. And the end user wants to know, well, how much can I really use or the available state of charge? Depth of discharge is another term, but is the exact opposite of state of charge. So if a battery is 50% charged, it would also be 50% empty. Both of these are expressed in as a percentage. Now, state of health is a little different than state of charge. State of health says for a battery that was initially designed for a certain amount of energy, how much can I actually get out of that original energy? If state of charge means it's full, as full as it can get, and as empty as it can get, the state of health may say, yeah, but full is a lesser amount, so it's 75% of what I used to be able to fill it to. Um, and that way, we can separate how healthy is the battery from how full is the battery. There are a number of other battery capability terms, such as state of power, peak power capability, you know, and et cetera, that are derived through various testing profiles in determining how the application construction uh, actually works. Inside of the battery, there is often a battery management system. Now, this battery management system may rely in part on a module or inside the pack, inside the vehicle. It may be broken apart. It may be all in one place. It can be anywhere. When I hear the term battery management system, it's easy to just convert this in my own head to electronics that are specifically designed and put in there to help with the energy and performance management of the battery pack. This provides the safety and protection, or it may be there to measure something such as voltage, current, temperature, uh, do some estimation for state of charge or state of health. But in general, it's some sort of electronics, whether it's sensors or a computer, that helps manage the overall battery pack system. So with these pieces, if we look inside of an electric vehicle battery, you'll often find cells which have been packaged together, possibly with some BMS electronics, into a module. And then multiple of these modules are packaged together with some component and wiring that ties into a pack level BMS that would also have management over a cooling interface. Through this at BMS, this is the way to look into the battery and would have some sort of communication protocol, whether it's CAN or Modbus or Serial, that an external control unit, such as the vehicle, could find information or control various aspects of the battery pack, such as talking to and actually even controlling the cooling interface or other cell balancing interfaces that are inside the battery pack. This means that there's data, of course, that needs to be exchanged between the battery pack and the outside world. And this battery data can be very important. It may even be necessary to make sure that the battery pack is charged correctly by looking at things like the cell voltage, the cell temperature, and information from the BMS as to what is the maximum allowed charge rate at any given time. Additionally, state of charge, or controlling of contactors or other interfaces can be controlled then either using the cycler and should be controlled is a way emulating the way that the vehicle would have been using this to get the best results 
out of understanding, does this battery actually work in that vehicle application? There are a wide range of people that are actually doing different kinds of testing. So it's unfortunate that I can't just say, here's the one test you need, because if you're in engineering and design validation, you would be testing and stressing both the modules and the packs to make sure that that module and pack design actually meets your design goals and hopefully the well-specified customer marketing needs. Once they've done many drive cycles and stress tests and performance tests and done a lot of testing to check that, the pack will eventually work its way into manufacturing. In manufacturing, usually the emphasis is more on did I put this system together correctly rather than does this system perform to meet the end goal. There's an assumption that the engineering characterization work has already been done and if I just put it together in a uniform and consistent way, then it will meet all of those performance specifications. And so they would have different types of tests running on the module and pack. There is a section of most manufacturing environments where a system validation or a QA is being done, making sure that that finished product does actually meet some, if not all, of the original engineering characterization tests. And so those people will often take a pack off the line, sometimes a module, but usually a pack, and run a portion again of some of the engineering characterization tests to make sure that this pack actually meets the design specification. In aftermarket, there's a wide range of devices and approaches here for second life, for depot repair, et cetera. A pack may be cycled slightly to determine is there really a problem with this battery pack before issuing a warranty repair. And in a Second Life application, the pack may be cycled to determine are there certain cells or modules inside the pack that should be discarded and then take and break the pack down and rebuild a new pack for a new application. That new pack would then need to be tested to make sure that it's safe. For example, one of the common uses of a LEAF battery pack is turning it into energy storage for RV systems. So again, many different kinds of tests depending on what function you're trying to achieve, whether it's from engineering to manufacturing, production, or even end of uh, aftermarket. When I mention that there's a wide range of tests, this is only a short list, and there's considerably more even listed in our application notes. You know, the engineer very well might be interested in testing the performance using a simulated environment, such as a drive cycle, uh, or a pattern that mimics the behavior of a user when using the vehicle in this way. Earlier, we talked about if I designed a skateboard, which had a motor, and a battery, and a frame, and I could put a car frame on it, then that drive cycle might be, what is the typical driving use pattern for this type of customer? And are they in the United States? Are they in Europe? Are they in Japan? Because different regions have different patterns for how they actually drive and use the vehicle. But if I put a package delivery truck on top of that same frame, then there's differences in the overall pattern. There's many more starts and stops and different power loading profiles than compared to a, a traditional car. There may be other tests that are being done, such as mechanical stress effects, making sure that it mechanically works inside of the vehicle, or checking the heating and cooling system efficiencies, and many, many more applications, again, per department, and what that department's goals on testing are to ensure that they produce a reliable and trusted pack for their end application. In virtually every case, because to make a battery work, it requires the battery to be charged, which is to provide electrical energy, and internally the chemistry changes, causing actual mechanical changes itself. The batteries will swell or contract as they are charged or discharged, and that will change the mechanical pressures with inside of the module or pack itself. But when we consider charge, a power source is applied and current is injected, 
the positive particles or lithium ions inside of the battery move from the cathode and bond chemically into the anode. When we later apply a load, the process is reversed as electrons are extracted, the positive particles or lithium ions actually move from the anode and bond chemically to the cathode in a lower chemical energy state. This is how a battery is actually allowed to make to work is by charging it and discharging it and is the only way that we can actually exercise the battery to make sure that the rest of the, whatever is being tested um, is being stressed. For a simple capacity test, we may need to just charge the battery until we reach some measure that says it's full, and then discharge the battery until that battery is telling us by voltage that it's empty. And the amount of energy that is put into and taken out of the battery would tell us how many amp hours or even kilowatt hours that battery has. For these types of simple tests, and using our 9300 as an example, we provided a uh, 710 volt EV battery and connected it up to our system and put our system into a charge state. Let me put on a spotlight here. By turning the system on, pressing the settings button, and could then set a voltage and a current limit and allow the battery to work itself up and climbing in voltage. Also see the amount of current, the amount of power, and even the measured terms, such as the amp hours, the kilowatt hours, and how long have we been doing this? As you can see, this is a fairly large battery. So we've already applied 67 and a half kilowatt hours, but we're not even quite yet to 710 volts. Using the exact same touch screen, and by simply pressing the, the settings button again, we were then able to put the system into a discharge state, providing a low, lower voltage, so that way we can make sure the battery doesn't discharge below this voltage, and a discharge current. Here, the battery voltage is coming down yet again, and then we can see that we've been doing that for a number of amp hours. Also, the total amount of power that we've achieved and the time that we've taken to do that. In this way, very simple tests such as charging, discharging, even capacity testing, can be done without having any software experience whatsoever. If you can manually connect, walk up to the system and simply turn it on and use it as a charger or a load, you can do so without needing any additional software or programming experience. When more complicated test patterns are involved, we provide you additional ways to be able to use the system. For those that prefer to write their own software, a complete set of LabVIEW drivers, as well as IVIC and IVI languages, or even a Skippy version is made available so that way you can integrate this directly into your own software and you have direct control over the hardware. When we put together a system, we often will use Enercron, which is our sequencing software and is truly a system software package that we'll explore later that can integrate with this hardware and then tie in other devices, such as temperature chambers, chillers, data acquisition, and build a comprehensive test environment. We're the only manufacturer that I'm aware of that gives you manual control options and by default, the drivers to be able to use it in your own software controlled or even with your own preferred integrators and has the option to add on a full system package. When I say more complicated cycling patterns, there's a large list of these, and this list is continuing to grow. For example, shown to the left here is the Federal Urban Driving Schedule, also known as FUDS, and is supposed to represent a typical American driver, you know, just using a normal vehicle. There's a wide list of these, even for America, such as highway profiles, tow profiles, hill climb profiles, and all are supposed to represent different users using different vehicle types in different applications. And so you would end up likely testing your battery and stressing it in an application-based way to make sure that you get the 
equivalent number of miles before you actually finish building the vehicle and find out that the battery was undersized or in some way deficient. These profiles are also then used in energy storage applications uh, and have different names, such as PJM. Uh, and again, are representing real-world application usages of the battery. Engineers will also typically use other types of stress profiles, such as the dynamic stress test profile or many other similar variations, because these can provide baseline information. We can use um, these simpler profiles to understand the dynamic characteristics of the batteries, like how much impedance does it have inside, or what's its peak power capability at a given state of charge, and then use that information to run more aggressive profiles or temperature profiles, like FUDs, to see you know, how does the battery change over time. If we move away from application-based focus to another system, we talked about BMSs. You can think of a BMS as a computer that's inside of the battery itself. Now, this computer needs to be taught. What does this voltage mean? Does that mean full or empty? What is this current sensor, which comes in as a voltage? How do I change that in terms and turn it into current in terms of amps? You know, what's the scaling factors? What's the calibration factors? And once we've taught the BMS, even just the simple basics of how to interface with the temp sensors and communicate to the outside world, there may be other features that the BMS is responsible for, such as safety features, where it makes a decision that an unsafe condition occurs, or even something more complex, like the state of charge and state of health estimations. All of these things are in the computer but to really make sure that the inboard computer does these calculations correctly, we have to cycle the battery because there is where the computer is actually seeing the measured inputs, seeing the voltage rises and the voltage dips. And so to verify those algorithms, so those computer programs inside of the BMS, we often also have to cycle the battery. Another place that should not be overlooked is for environmental testing. Whether it's temperature, sealing, salt spray, etc. If we consider a standard that's used for vehicles, such as 60068-2-11, this standard talks about doing salt fog testing and making sure that any of the electrical components don't end up having a problem when they are exposed to a corrosive environment and then cycled on and off and used. As you can see in the picture in the lower right here, there's a salt phase that operates for a number of hours, and then the device is supposed to be turned on. Now, what is on? Well, this is generally manufacturer dependent. You know, we need to at least, I'm sure, turn on the battery and make sure that its contactor activates. But since there is variation that happens inside of the battery, this generally involves some sort of cycling, such as charging the battery and then discharging the battery may even be charging and discharging the battery using an application profile as a way to try to get more test data done in an efficient way. If we switch our topic over to the evolution of battery test systems, we've talked about terminology, we've talked about some of the challenges, but how can we actually achieve getting the battery test data that we so desire? I've personally worked with most of these solutions and I would encourage you uh, or even done directly these solutions. And I would encourage you to think about these following questions as we move forward, looking through manual methods, the construction of a source load, the automated systems, or even the next generation systems like NH researches. The first question I would ask, have you ask yourself is, how high is the resource commitment? You know, what expertise is needed to get this thing running? And how much expertise am I committing to it to keep it running? and to even analyze the results at the end. The second question I would ask, have you ask is, you know, what's my total cost of ownership? And this is not only just the investment in terms of capital equipment, but also those resources that are needed from up above. Are there any risks associated with this particular approach? You know, to the unit under test itself, to my laboratory, 
And I'd hate to make a decision that actually costs me more down the road because I didn't safe properly account for the risks. And also, what's the work quality output? What do I actually get when I use one of these approaches? And how good is that data? How repeatable is that data? If we look at some of the basic or good enough manual solutions, and I have to say, we actually get customers that are still doing this type of thing where they're using manual resistors and calculating data much the same as I did back in 1995. One of our principal engineers walked in and handed me this potentiometer. And not this particular one, it's a picture of very similar to the one I used and said, I want some discharge curves for this new battery and I want to see it at various temperatures, minus 20, minus 10, zero, so that way I can get an understanding of how well does this battery work compared to the nickel batteries we'd used. It seemed simple enough and I was actually able to get started testing that day. All I needed to do was grab a power supply, a couple of fluke meters, a notepad, get familiar with the temperature chamber, and I was already charging and discharging that battery literally that same day. Unfortunately, while the battery was discharging, I had to continuously adjust the potentiometer so that way I could keep the meter measuring current a constant value. So every day while the battery was discharging, I was 100% involved in actually keeping the test going and recording the voltage and current numbers as the battery is discharged. I then also needed to be very careful as I charged it on the power supply to make sure that I wasn't overcharging the batteries and was properly terminating the charge by unplugging the battery from the power supply. So this was very time intensive, and had I walked away, even for a matter of a few minutes, I ran the risk of irreparably damaging the unit under test. But after about 10 days and some Excel work, we were able to get a set of curves very similar to what you see on the right here, which expressed the battery's behavior under this very simple charging and discharging profile, and I could get started day one with near 100% commitment of a co-op. We decided that since we were gonna likely do this time and time again, that it didn't make sense and it was a little too risky to, and the data just wasn't quite clean enough, that it actually made sense to invest in building our own cycler using power supplies and loads. We did that in 1996, and then I redid that again with another company in 2008. And this is a picture of a cycler that I had personally worked on putting together. Now, unfortunately, building a cycler like this, you can't get started testing day one. It took about two months to actually acquire the equipment and then make sure that we test the equipment and find workarounds for leakage current paths, for inrush of capacitors, and all the other parasitic characteristics that were not expected. This was especially true in 96, and while I was prepared in 2008 for many of these factors, the demo unit that I valued from the rep had options that I was unaware of that could only be bought at during the point of manufacture, so I did not buy my power supply with these correct options. This meant I had to design a new interface panel just to, a, to address the shortcomings of the power supply when being used in a battery test way. So again, after about two months of myself and a high level uh, engineering co-op, we got the system put together, complete with the software tools, and were able to write and conduct our first battery test. This provided easy and repeatable testing and the additional safety, but again, lots of work before getting started. I would like to note, though, that in 1996, as well as in 2008, the second use of this system was not actually battery testing, but because it was designed to be a general purpose tester that was capable of battery testing, we actually used it to test our battery powered products in both cases. Which brings me to automated systems. Nearly every battery test system on the market can be thought of as an automated or an embedded system. And many of those manufacturers ask me, why did I build my own rack and stack system when I could have just used one of theirs? And the answer was pretty simple. I wanted the flexibility that came from my own source load system because I didn't want to just test batteries. 
where I wanted to have the flexibility to do whatever I wanted, uh, and I was able to do that with a source load system, versus an embedded system. Embedded systems, whether it's uh, shown here on the right, you know, like a little microcontroller, or even the traditional battery test systems where the main step is charge, rest, discharge, or variations of those themes, try to simplify all of that front-end work that I had to do with the source load system by inherently taking the flexibility out of the system and make it so that way it's just a very simple programming language and also then very simple, only few functions that it can do. For embedded systems, it can do more complicated patterns like the DST and even some drive cycles, but it doesn't have the flexibility to really adapt and mimic real world conditions. This is where next generation systems come into play. We'd like to see the benefits and the full flexibility where you can do things the way you'd want to do things under a source load system, but with the easy programming capability of an automated system. And so if we consider NH Research's approach, we start with Enercron, which is our test system sequence software that can control any of the battery cyclers. These directly can be attached or, and provided with communications interface to talk to the battery or other temperature chambers, have relays, I.O., data acquisition, additional power supplies and loads, et cetera, to provide a fully comprehensive test system that mimics the way that that battery or module is being used in the end vehicle. As we look then through our uh, previous slides, you know, there are technology trends, increases in voltage to drive things like faster charging. There's widening of the power and voltage ranges for various batteries and applications, including cars, trucks, buses, etc. And with declining battery costs and increased use of lithium ions and alternative methods, this is really driving the need for these newer solutions that provide a faster and easier and more repeatable way to provide test solutions, covering those wider operating envelopes and providing a way to modularly and scalable, scaling the system, both for power as well as third-party components that are needed to complete the test. Oops, sorry, I kicked out of the presentation mode. There we go. So some of the main things that I would have you consider when you're looking at a battery test system, you know, does the software actually come or is there a power test executive software package that's available? Not just that it says it can scale of one or two values, but could we actually emulate many of the key vehicle systems? Could I emulate the cooling system for the battery pack or drive a chiller to emulate that cooling system while simultaneously controlling additional cooling devices, such as temperature chambers and other third-party devices. Now, it's also important to assess the hardware performance of the cycler, for sure, but does it have the operating reach to meet both today's needs as well as the evolving needs, and is scalable so that way you can increase or change and reconfigure it to meet the power for each individual test? You know, how easy is it to integrate those third-party tools? You know, as these battery packs are evolving, new features are being added to the battery packs, including power supplies. So being able to load different outputs uh, from the same test environment is becoming more important to mimic the vehicle's behavior. And finally, is there safety built in, in a way that helps protect the laboratory and the investment in this entire asset? This is the first time I really talked about safety and so let's make sure we, uh, we talk about what we mean by building up safety in layers. The first layer where things are supposed to be caught is usually in the sequence and logic design. And we have an upcoming webinar in the next few weeks where we will talk about how the variables can be used in a way to make sure that the sequence logic stays solid, even if you're testing with different battery packs and scaling. There's also a, a generally a good idea, and this is in our Intercron, to have a separate monitoring device or a separate monitoring thread to make sure that things are still working correctly. 
From there, we actually, through hardware, extend the number of layers with programmable hardware limits, wired external interlocks, emergency power off circuits, communication watchdogs. So if a problem is supposed to be caught, it should be caught in layer one, but when it's missed, then layer two is there to catch it, and the third layer is to catch it, and the fourth layer is to catch it, to make sure that we provide the best level of coverage to catch any perceived problem or potential problem. And we give you the tools to develop your overall safety plan, including both hardware and software features, so you can customize even the safety to your laboratory environment. Our 9300s, for example, provide a very wide operating range, working in both the lower class electric vehicles as well as the higher class electric vehicle, voltage class electric vehicles. So whether your projects are migrating towards or even bouncing back and forth between these two, the same product can be easily reconfigured to cover both of these different types of applications. And it's scalable in power. So by having two modules, we would end up with two 100 kilowatt systems, but we can add then a third module which then gives us the flexibility of three individual 100 kilowatt testers or a 300 kilowatt tester or any combination in between. This can be expanded all the way up to 2.4 megawatts, giving you the future proof in the modular power. You can configure it to meet that testing need and then use the, same, the remaining equipment to conduct another test. And as we talked about earlier, we focus on giving you flexibility in how to control the system. You can control it through our touch interface, you can control it through Intercron, through LabVIEW, and so work with your own software, your favorite integrator, or have us help you work on building that customized test environment. It's through this power of automation choice where you're really in control of how do you want to control the test environment and providing hardware with advanced features that's scalable and modular, and then through our sequencing software, make it very easy to integrate third-party devices that we provide you with the next generation in battery test systems. So what did we learn today? Unfortunately, the topic of battery testing and battery testing itself is extremely complex and time-consuming. Battery module pack testing is best done when it focuses on the end application and making sure that that battery actually meets the customer's expectation. And these application-based cycling patterns, they're getting more sophisticated all of the time. Many more drive cycles, there's an increasing library of tools um, and patterns which are mimicking the user's behaviors. And so some of the key strategies for accurately testing are in selecting very flexible tools that have those advanced hardware features software controls that allow you to customize the use methods and integrate non-cycler manufactured devices. So I'd invite you to look at our website where we have our 9200 series. This is a lower power system that is up to 12 kilowatts per module that has various voltage and current levels to meet various types of module and small pack needs versus our 9300 system, which is a 600 volt or 1200 volt software switchable 100 kilowatt module that's easily extended to cover some of the larger high voltage pack needs. There's also a wealth of additional information on our website and Julie will be sending this along, including um, test solutions, information about our test executive, the SAP note that drove this white presentation, the fundamentals of battery test white paper, and you can talk to one of our experts. Just as a plug for the future, we are going to be doing an electric vehicle powertrain test solution uh, webinar coming up on May 13th. And again, look for one in the next few weeks or month or so for Intercron, where we will go into more details of testing and how you can use variables to really accelerate your testing uh, applications. At this point, I'd like to thank you for attending, and I know we ran very close to an hour but uh, Julie may have a couple of questions for us to try to answer. Yes, thank you so much, Martin, for that valuable presentation. 
Um, I do want to remind people that there is a question box in the toolbox to the right. If you want to enter your questions, if we run out of time, we will make sure to follow up with you. So let's, the first question is, how do I measure voltage, state of charge, and state of health per cell and per pack or module? Okay. It's a great question, uh, and, and it has various levels of complexity. Um, if you're measuring a cell, you know, by itself, uh, voltage is pretty simple. You hook up a meter to it. Once you start putting it inside of a module or a pack, it starts to become considerably more complicated to measure voltages. Yes, you can usually or hook up a data acquisition device to measure things like voltage and temperatures, and sometimes that's needed. It's also very common to use the battery management system itself to extract some of those simpler parameters, such as voltage, temperature, etc. And through Enercron, we can use that uh, communication with the BMS to bring that in as if it was any form of measured data, just the same as a data acquisition device, and then act on it. Um, state of charge gets to be a much more interesting topic. Now, 100% state of charge, most people would agree, is full. 0% state of charge would mean empty. But what is full? You know, is full chemically full? You know, is it as much as you possibly can put into it? Uh, or is full the designed or agreed designed upon full? It's like a five gallon bucket from Home Depot store. It will hold five gallons of water, but if you and I agree that we'll only fill the bucket halfway by design, then when the bucket is filled halfway, now that's 100% full. And when it's empty, it's empty. So what is empty? And so battery manufacturers can reserve some of that, and that's the difference between like a chemical state of charge and a design state of charge, or even an available capacity, which then factors in things like state of health uh, or other operating conditions, et cetera. Um, so how to best measure state of charge? Uh, you can measure the energy, you know, whether it's amp hours or kilowatt hours, but you would need to apply some other concepts such as Am I looking at it just purely from a what's the maximum the battery could store or what's the maximum my user can get out of it before I can actually answer a state of charge question? Um, state of health, again, that's another one of those that per, per expectation will change based on how it's intended to be used. You know, maybe we're only expecting to use this a couple of times. so. As long as it's going to do it a, a few times, that's good, or it's expected to last for 10 years, like an electric vehicle. And so state of health can have a very, very different uh, meaning, um, and that is usually more manufacturer-specific. Uh, second question, there has been, there's actually a few questions about internal resistance. Can you okay. explain a little bit more about why it is important? and how it is used? So since we talked about batteries acting as an electrochemical device, it takes chemical energy and changes its chemical makeup to provide electrical energy. One of the things that actually comes out of that as a byproduct is both chemical and physical resistance. Um, you know, once I've created electrical energy, how useful that electrical energy is depends on you know, the wire between uh, wherever the source of energy is and wherever I want to use it. And it's because the wire has resistance. The same thing applies inside of a battery, but it's a little more complicated in that batteries can have a dynamic resistance. They can also have something called DC resistance or DCIR, and these will act to limit how much power can I pull out of a battery before I actually even find it the contactors, the connection points, the connectors, the wire, and the rest of the system. Depending on the battery chemistry, this can be anywhere from, you know, hundreds of milliohms to a few milliohms, and then depending on the construction. If I put a whole bunch of batteries in series, the resistance goes up, If I but I also get a higher voltage, so I have less current. And when I put them in parallel, the current or impedance goes down, which means I can get a lot more current, but I'm at a lower voltage. And so there's, a, there's testing situ, uh, behaviors like EIS for cells 
or uh, HPPC for figuring out the peak power capability, doing DCI or pulse tests, and other ways to try to understand the resistance of a module, a pack, and in some cases even a cell, um, to determine how useful is that battery in a particular application. Thank you. And here's another question. Um, how would a module or pack be tested while being able to test at the component level as well? This is the case in repurposing a battery from an electric vehicle. Okay. So we, we have a couple of customers that are actually doing Second Life applications. And one of the things that they've found is that sometimes the battery, when it arrives, there's actually nothing wrong with it. Uh, it was just easier for their, wherever they got their battery from to say this battery probably may or may not have a problem, so we're just going to replace them all. In that case, you know, doing a simple test right at first, just cycling the battery a few times, throwing some patterns at it, and verifying that the battery's performance is actually still uh, basically new um, means that nothing needs to be done to the battery. Uh, it can often be recertified and then sent back to its supplier as a remanufactured battery. Uh, a second level of that is sometimes the connector system, or maybe there's some small mechanical damage that's easily repaired. But once there's mechanical damage, you still need to make sure that the system is still actually working fine. And if there's nothing wrong electronically, electrically inside, then you know the system can be usually certified and, and uh, returned very quickly. When something is wrong inside, such as a cell or a module or pack is, is not working as expected and has actually failed, test, testing the pack and interrogating the BMS can often identify where, which module or cells are going charging at a faster rate than they're supposed to or discharging at a slower rate than they're supposed to, suggesting that those batteries are very weak. Once the pack is then disassembled, by knowing which ones are already weak, you can reduce the amount of further down the line testing by removing those that you know will not pass. And this then accelerates the rest of the modules that have a chance of being tested or put into a, a second life um, and not wasting time on systems that we know will not actually work. Okay. and. I think we have just um, just time for one more question. Um, how would you accelerate battery testing even further? Well, as we were talking about throughout the presentation, there are some tests like the environmental tests where yes, we need to cycle the battery while we're doing something like a salt fog test. So making sure that we that, that there's a plan in place as to where all of the different types of tests are being covered will also help make sure that you're running the right types of tests in the right place to, to give you the widest coverage map. Beyond that, making sure that you eliminate those having to rerun tests. And that's where next, uh, within the next few weeks or month or so, we will have an Intercron training webinar, and I encourage you guys to attend that, um, where we will cover how to make sure that you build a robust test so that way you don't in get a mistake creeping in that causes you to have to rerun the test a second time. That's a huge amount of time. So by mis removing those errors and doing some creative planning, we can help you to actually achieve a most efficient way to get the battery test results. Thank you so much, that's, Martin. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you want to say anything else? No, is that, that's the last question we're going to take for today. Yes, unfortunately, we are out of time right now, but um, thank you everyone for participating and for all your questions. We will make sure to follow up with you if you did submit a question. And if you have any further questions you think of, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, just a reminder that we do have a survey, a quick survey at the end of this webinar. If you could please complete that, we'll be able to support your efforts and provide valuable content. We also have a powertrain webinar coming up on May 13th. You could register on our 
website and we will be sending out the presentation as well as the recording of today's webinar um, within the week. So thank you all very much for participating. Stay safe out there and have a great day. Thank you, Martin. Thank you.